so let's let's take a look. So I was looking at okay, well, thinking about what's uh what's an easy way to implement controls, remote controls for our hydraulics. And the advantage we have is we already have the high power hydraulics. We've built the hydraulic devices, power cubes that are modular. We know how to use these controller, these uh, solenoids like this, which are just simply on-off valves. So you got any big machine like a tractor, a, a heavy motor, or a big cylinder. Yeah, you can control it just like that. All you're doing is um, using a relay uh, in a step before that. The relay gets a little signal from a microcontroller like an Arduino or this Arduino compatible thing that has Wi-Fi built in. So that's like, okay, that's Arduino. You program it with Arduino IDE. Easy. You got to just download a library to, like, for example, if you want to use this thing with Wi-Fi, all you need to do in Arduino environment is download, download a library that handles an extension that handles that. So you'll see that appear as one of your devices. Typically, you see like, okay, Arduino Mega, Arduino Uno, many other ones. This is just another one you can run in the same environment. So then if you have a cell phone, you can you can go that route. And so I was looking at, okay, how do you do like stuff that anybody has? Everyone has a cell phone, so you could do a like a joystick app where you're actually controlling it. You're touching it and releasing on on a phone like this joystick app like I found this video like I was googling this and I just found this real quick um, skip the ads here and so they've got this joystick take a look it's uh it's that little button on that that's how the blink app looks look right there it's like that's your joystick in a piece of software that <clears throat> that does that it's called the blink app so I was like oh cool that's easy uh, this guy shows everything how to do it uh, including that the node MCU thing so this thing you just touch it you know you touch it one way or another way uh, and then he makes that thing line up that's wireless going through uh, going through wireless now what happens if that that was our microcontroller con connected to the solenoid valves that that control the tractor well that's it's as easy as that so that's kind of inspired that's pretty cool uh all right we could knock that off in a in a day the, the current so the current controls on the on the on the tractor is that like the levers you pull is that a mechanical uh, a, like uh effect, you affect the the valves basically of the hydraulic system mechanically yeah. by those yeah uh what happens in a valve you have um so you got these valves. It's mechanical. It's a it's a piston that goes inside your cavity, oh, and depending good. on the piston has has notches in it, has rings in it, notched out, so that when you push it, like maybe it's closed off right now, but when you push it, it it hits that ring. So if you look at actually what a piston hydraulic valve piston. It's that. It's this cartridge thing, and depending on, uh, let's take a look at some images. When it's pushed in, and that notched out part, for example, is engaged, that might let fluid through. If it's like, well, I don't really understand how this explicitly works, but if it's like against, if the flow flow goes like that, um, by exposing that part, it could either like let flow through or it can let it go in the holes and wh whatever the geometry is but basically think of a, a mechanical block it's like going like that and like that at high pressure they typically do it with cylinders why cylinders because they're easy to seal with o-rings because this is high pressure like 3000 psi so these things are typically cylindrical and uh, that's what's happening inside a valve like here here's a d diagram like it's kind of like whether this is mechanical where you push that so that corresponds to that cylinder you push it here it's blocking off the ports when you push it towards that indented part it's actually opening up the ports so this could be uh, enacted either by hand or with a solenoid so the solenoid allows you for electric control the manual is you're there and you have to move it 
you're typically on the tractor because you're not going to have like long hoses and a valve that's really inconvenient, right? Um, so the only way you can do the lever valves if you're sitting on a machine. And the real very practical thing for me, like right now, if I could get that, that Blink app working, uh, like for example, now I was actually uh, grading drainage around the CD Go Home 2 with a micro track. I'm, I'm sitting on it, I'm going back and forth with the bucket, but I can't really see what's in the bucket. I like to like be actually in front of it and have my yeah. controller and see exactly what I'm doing. Okay, I gotta get that dirt, I gotta bite a little deeper with the bucket because I can't really see over it. So it's, it is actually quite convenient, one, for the fact that it's safety, because you're not on a machine that can tip or like you go backwards and you don't know a tree is behind you and you crush yourself and things like that. I mean, there's real safety issues to operating heavy equipment. I so, my uh, uncles like drove the tractor off the side of the hill. He, he almost got crushed. Well, he made it. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. They have rollover protection, the bar that's on top of a tractor or a cab that protects you. But the danger thing is real. So, so an app like this or a, a remote controller is quite a quite a useful device. Cool. Uh, and it will be actually pretty cool. Yeah. So. This was the inspiration I was thinking about it. So, but to talk about, I mean, that's just one aspect, like the that little joystick thing is one aspect, but do we have everything that's downstream? Well, yeah. I mean, the DC relays, we know how to do that. We do that for the CB press and we run that through an Arduino that's below this board in our CB controller. It's no, no big deal there. What you have is you got power, you got 12 volts, you've got these little, uh, black blocks which are the actual relays there's actually a a winding that moves a piston back and forth to make a contact that's what happens in there just like on a power cube you've got the relay for the starter it's also a coil it moves a heavier contact to make it touch to handle much more current than the signal that you're using to trigger it so in this case here with that four channel relay that's the exact the same one we actually use on a CEB press and we've got that here you activate it by two leads going from output pins from an Arduino so uh, that that one there is typically typically rides on top of a Arduino Uno or Mega because uh, those are actually compatible boards the, the, that pin out on this this specific micro uh, this specific relay shield that's a relay shield it, it's plugged into the top of the Arduino so that you don't have to make any wire connections, the pins, all the connections are already there. So whatever code you program into your Arduino, you can activate those four relays accordingly. And then those bigger terminals, therefore the outputs, uh, four, three wires per output. So there's four of those black blocks and four sets of terminals. Not sure why they have three three per each but yeah the wiring diagram is online uh, so you need power to this and a signal to this and then you connect whatever you want to trigger and that thing you want to trigger is your solenoid valve so the solenoid valve you know, we were talking about this kind of system like the other day solenoids valves they live on top of their screwed down with bolts these bolts that come with them to this block that has the in and out hydraulic power lines from the power cube and then you can control the outputs. There's going to be four outputs, like those four holes on top there. Those are the actual in-out, in-out for each valve. So this is bi-directional. we got two channels, so you can control two cylinders or two motors going back and forth. We know this stuff. So, so we, we know everything uh, from here. We haven't really played with this kind of a route. Um, so Wes is saying, yes, a joystick, you can print that. Uh, this does rely on wireless. So for example, we can do it in the shop. We got wireless there and you know, we can play with that. What if we don't have wireless? For the use case that you have, you just want to be standing in front of the mic for track with your cell phone. You just need to create a hotspot using your cell phone or have a dedicated hotspot that's plugged into the battery. So still relying on 
hotspot from satellites? No, no, no. Local. Just local? Yeah, just a, a local ad hotspot. Well, you, we, need, uh, we need GPS and Wi-Fi everywhere on the farm to be able to autonomously control the tractor. Mm -hmm. Anywhere on the farm, anywhere else on the farm. But that's a different set of problems. Well, that's a much more advanced problem well, here. We're just saying... Problem. It's a remote control. Yeah, but it's a, it's a, it's a more complex way of it. But you well, can, we're you saying can make like that work by making a local hotspot as a manual saying with your phone. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, it depends on the use case. Like, yeah, if you want to have completely autonomous control, then yes, you're absolutely correct. But I think that there are steps to make there. Yeah, there's steps. I mean, this would be like step one, just to see the, the controls. So what I do here, I go, I go to settings uh -huh. on my phone, and what I do. You uh, turn on your local hotspot, which you already. So I go to network and internet. Yeah. And then, then where hotspot and tethering off. So I go Wi-Fi hotspot, turn yeah. it on. Yeah. And that's it. And you should program the Arduino so it can recognize your Wi-Fi and su submit the password you set automatically. Yeah. Um, so I turn it on. I got a hotspot name. I got security hotspot password. So I just get to set that and that's it. And then I'm set and I can do this. Yeah. Perfect. There's probably even a WPS connect option too, so you don't even need a password in my favorite. Sure. Yeah, and I'm using AP band 2.4 gigahertz, so I got what, like 30 meters at least? It's more than that, right? Could be, uh, outdoors, yeah. If you were running an autonomous mission, would you want to use your computer or your your phone to basically start and monitor? I would want to do both. I would want to check in on the computer at home. I, I'm in my control studio. I'm doing a podcast and letting a remote user <laughs> plant my potatoes. <laughs> that, that sounds great. And, um, but in, out, in the field there, I'm out there what I described the use case. I want to look at exactly like what's my bucket doing because I, I can look more closely without being in danger. And stuff like that so there's various use cases the simplest one being just to see something work remotely like i'm saying like what do we have if we've got a few days left to, to play with um, powerful industrial equipment and <laughs> basic automation uh what can we get done because that, that's another use case too soil mixer soil conditioner right? yeah you know that thing if you build a big enough one that's a lot of force and a lot of stuff moving around and if you want to make precise control and adjustments to your mix like in situ yeah it's nice to be able to stand back and yeah the tea. yeah exactly yeah. instead of like because i've been there mixing cob you know throwing buckets of straw in with the hose and everything like that trying to get the right blend and if i could sit there on a tablet and just actuate water and yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah sure stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, and it's like this is kind of low hanging fruit because yeah. it's not not too hard. It's hard in the sense that you got all these elements, but we've got a lot of the latter elements there, which are the kind of like the hard ones okay. mechanically. Well, let's do it. Or when I get this shipping container dropped on my land and I turn it into my, my little fab shop, it'd be nice to be able to have a selector inside of the app on the tablet that lets me control all of it. Oh, there you go. Yeah, we, need yeah. that, we need that by 2028. The, uh, 2028. The container of Global Village. Consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you got your tablet. You like, you got your selection now. Okay, I want to use the CB press. Bam. And you've got, you know, you can have, literally, I mean, the use case is we got our micro factory. We've got our soil piles. You got the tractor with a camera. You can actually go on your computer. You can control it. You can you can do the operation that you're doing out there from your con control computer in your house if you want to. Like, for example, I get a I get an order for some bricks, and you know I just get on my tab of my computer and say, oh, okay, I'll actually start that process. <laughs> I, and you could even then talk about things like, okay, you pre-program your tractor because you know the soil is there. You go up to it, you lift it. You have a pre-prescribed path and you just repeat those motions back and forth without you even being there it's all doable you have to do do a lot of effort in terms of how you set it up you want to be careful about that and but then it's like automation and you can actually you know that promise of us doing whatever we need to do in our life to enrich our life and make a better world as, as opposed to just trying to make a living kind of a thing so i mean that promise is still there to be to be de delivered to more people, yeah. 
ultimate use case is November 23rd, 2021, 7.30 p.m. at night, and you still want to work in the shop. It's just cool, guys. Oh, you, uh, <laughs> you get a night vision camera on these things, <laughs> and these things could be running 24-7. There's no reason to. Ken, you can get torch and blades from the kitchen. You can not stand with torch and blades, man. Yeah, in Indonesia. <laughs> Well, let's let's wire up the. We can do. We have the solenoid cube that we haven't touched. Let's wire up all the solenoid valves so that we can, then plug in. Like what? Let's see. I mean, Wes, you think you can do the part one and two? Wire it up. Download the software. Mm -hmm. Get the joystick on there. Yeah. Do we have the how to do that? We got the Node MCU. It's in the shop. Huh. So we have everything. Yeah. We've got everything here. Are we going to control just the power cube? or No, you can something? control the micro track. Micro track. Because, okay, so how do you connect it? So you've got the solenoid valve ver power cube, that, that component, outside of your solenoid valves, these solenoid valves, you can have quick connectors right in the block. So what do you need to control the tractor to go back and forth and spin in circles? You need to connect those power outlets take the hoses from the micro track they're quick connect just plug them in here lay your power cube your automated cube on top of the the micro track and you got your your uh, cell phone and you can control that okay oh, so think about that so basically you're just unplugging the existing power cube unplug so okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah existing power cube is on a micro track let's say let's say we use that there's a power cube it's got two hoses that come out of it with quick couplers that right now we plug into our valves. Take those hoses, plug them as the in and out of your automation power cube, which would have, with two valves you can go back and forth and turn. So we should do that, do two valves, uh, create that power cube with the two valves, have an in and out quick connect. We can set that right on a micro track, plug in the hoses from the micro track into it, and we're ready to control it automatically. That would be pretty cool. Mm -hmm, definitely. Is, is four channels enough? Four channels is, yeah, the yeah. two solenoids back and forth. You got one one wheel motor on each side. Yeah. It goes forward, back, and if you go like that, it spins around. And that's two channels. Two channels yeah. of uh, bi-directional valves. Bucket. Yeah, that we haven't considered yet, but I mean, okay, we've got four you. of them. We've got four of these uh, yeah. if we want to, okay. but start with two. Like, let's get two things going. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we can add the two other ones, not a problem. It's just another set of two hoses that um, plug into. We would divide the, the power from the power cube into two, or like put them downstream of one another. Actually, put them downstream of one another, and then it will work. Okay. So I was thinking about our current, uh, just more generally, our current approach to the power cubes and like separating stuff that's most likely to fail. The only thing I'm worried about is that it takes up so much more space. So I was thinking like in a micro track or something like that. I don't think you really have room. So no, you don't have to, room for that. This is proof of concept. But if you're going to design it for real, you'd build that into a, an integrated power cube. Yeah, that's, that's my thought. It's like, how can we just make it more movable? Yeah. Like what we're doing right now is kind of like to play with for education and for like larger devices where you can easily fit it. But right now on a micro track, I mean that power cube is packed as it is already. It's kind of hard to fit the, you know, the fan on there already and stuff like that. It's tight. That's a difficult. Like once you once you try to actually compact it, it gets a little hard. Yeah. But in things like live track and bigger, it's pretty easy. You got a lot of space. Yeah, because we're trying to get the the micro track actually within like 42 inches, which is like the industry standard for these compact yard machines. You know, so yeah. Um, I'd say like let's wire this thing up to get an experiment well the third third part of the power cubes uh, we could get a team on this Wes on uh, electronics uh, so there's the frame there's the valves I mean we've got those on individual blocks so we can get two people on that we can do four valves if we want to but basically the inlet um, Inlet quick connector. Here we have the power, the actual the pressure switch. We don't need that necessarily. Uh, if we do use that, 
um, we would have the ability to sense pressure and say, oh, the pressure got high, stop. So for example, if you hit a tree, pressure goes high, stop automatically. You know, some lot you can add logic like that. I just wanted to it's like a bug in the in the blink gap and we have like a three thousand pound <laughs> metal <laughs> mini bulldoze you know, doing circles or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's well, like the shape of my operating system updated. <laughs> sure, yeah. I, I studied I studied next one a day studying the safety critical system, so it's probably fun. Sure. I'll still stand a little bit back on everybody. Yeah, like uh, we would do it in an open area first before. Yeah, I mean, test it. So how do you test this thing? Immediately you would plug in, a, you know, say a cylinder. You got a bunch of cylinders. Just put in a cil plug in a cylinder to these outlets. Put it on a table. Do your blink cap. Does the joystick work to ex extend and retract it? And if we're confident about that, you can take it to the tractor. And um, th that joystick thing is like you have to hold it to make it go. Yeah. So if you release it. it it turns off. turns off. Now the questions you got to ask is what happens when you lose connectivity? Do, connectivity does it like keep it on or yeah. what's its safety no, it system? <laughs> your phone no, dies. Yeah. Back. <laughs> you drop your phone. <laughs> what happens? It, it's got to have some like safety valves for safety checks for how how that actually works in practice. Yeah. We place a little bit of uh, remote detonated C4 on it in worst case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> stop it, stop it! <laughs> You're worried it's the Amish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, um, I don't know, like, what's uh, what's an idea of, I mean, in, in these applications, when what happens, like, software side, you're, you're running some loop, I guess. You want an operation fail mode, or like a... Yeah, like, Most. how do you make sure that when you're... Let's do Operation Halt, like, if it's, you know, you have a dead man switch on the phone, if it, if it stops interacting, you just turn it off or something. So if say, like, you, you completely lose, like, I don't know, like, how do you make sure that when your phone loses power at the time you're pressing it up, that it's not triggering that well I don't know is I don't know how the the wireless signals work but they should probably it might take like a while default to, to it zero yeah. the source code. it might take me a whole day to audit the source code for something like that but I'm pretty sure it's not meant to I'd say like the in, in my most rudimentary uh, implementation agnostic approach you take your whole entire implementation code put it in a big like wild and you just keep sending a signal from your phone to the controller that it's looking for. And while that signal is on, the rest of the code goes, and if that signal ever goes away, it just passes. It stops the whole program. Hmm. It's sort of like it, it uh, resets all of your control signals. Yeah, I mean, it's made for any cloud controller. I can't imagine it's supposed to just stay out of command somehow. Yeah. It's yeah. like the sloppy engineering. I'm not a programmer, but I can make it happen. Approach. <laughs> just keep pinging it constantly, and as long as that signal was there in a certain time when the your code still runs, it kind of resets. Yeah. The, the only problem with that approach is it probably exactly. make sure the signal is encrypted, so that someone <laughs> can't uh, have like a false a uh, false uh, signal in reception. Yeah. The control right. Just not only that, but that approach is very power consumptive. That'd be the other thing. If you drain down the battery, that'd be yeah. quicker because you would have You'd also have a, 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 light, a, a string or a rope to the <laughs> fuel, fuel pump connector and then you can <laughs> joint. Yeah, I don't think we'll have that issue. But uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see it race down walls. <laughs> directed, yeah. Directed EMPs, you know, there are ways. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, in this, what's the minimum product here? You got the block, you got the solenoid on it. Quick connector on one side, quick connector on the other through a fitting, like whatever the fitting there. I was talking to you about the O-rings, like if you observe this one, for example. So if we zoom in, we're talking about NPT, National Pipe Thread, versus O-ring connections, which are S called SAE fittings. Here, this fitting that goes into the block specifically is designed as one of those o-ring fittings you can't screw in a regular npt like that here like you see all these npt you notice that they're npt because they don't have any of that black the rubber on it so but here 
we got these fittings. Yeah. The minimum is like, well, avoid this, the safety, the bypass valve. You can avoid like, you don't need, need a gauge. You don't need the pressure sensor. The minimum viable product there is just put a quick connect fitting on it, inlet outlet, so we can connect to the, the micro track. And then you screw down your, the solenoids onto, they screw down on the side with the multiple holes. The small holes there, they're the bolt holes for the bolts that come with the solenoids. And those four, four larger ones, those are the actual fluid channels. So you see like, those, those are pretty small. They're like, not much bigger than a quarter inch, but yeah, they handle quite a bit of flow. This is high pressure stuff. But yeah, we mm. want to try to install this on the micro track. That's All we need to do is, uh, well, let's use the frame because we want to mount this. So let's use the frame. We mount this whole system and that and just put it on top of, uh, put in a loader bucket of the micro track but, right there. Okay, yeah, but mm. does that not already have one of these uh, aluminum blocks? No, we don't. We have the manual valves. We've got the, all the manual levers. Yeah. So is this specifically Different. for electric and sol solar? Right? Yeah, that's very specific. That's, that's very unique that just works with those solenoids. The solenoids themselves have that fourfold hole pattern on their bottom. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's just just for that. So the control section needs to be switched out with this sort of apparatus. Okay. Yeah, we leave the all the levers on a micro track so we don't have to destroy any of that. We yeah. just take the hose and yeah. plug it into our automation power cube yeah. section. Yeah, duct tape. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's pretty cool. So you can you can do both both like oh yeah so instead of putting the operator on this on uh you know the operators stand there put your power cube on the remote control power cube on there that's your operator now oh. so that'll be the, the convenient yeah. place I to put it i can't wait to get stuff delivered to my land in georgia and i'm like oh hey hey yeah i'm not there right now just hold on a second <laughs> <laughs> I'm on <my> crow track. <laughs> yeah yeah. But imagine also yeah. like, think about what happens to community supported agricultural operations if you have computer vision automation like this. Think about it. So you get orders and you got delivery day. Well, if you've got an autonomous vehicle, you can be doing the delivery Pick from your uh, computer. Um, and then you got like the full like automated stuff but you can still do like it's not a far cry to have wi-fi and an actual connection to your vehicle you see where it's going that's probably going to be code approved before the fully autonomous vehicles you know and then you can have lower lower your costs if you if you have that infrastructure in terms of delivering things you know so it's so definitely an application I thought about that because community supported agriculture operations, the difficult part is, I mean, you got small customers, many small customers. Well, that's, it's costly to deliver to them. Well, this is one way to, through automation, you can lower those kinds of costs. It's doable. Yeah. Uh, I, one thing that open source hardware is lacking is uh, this automated storage and retrieval system. Oh, uh, you're talking about data? What? Uh, no, mechanical, like store, physical? Storage and retrieval system. Basically like a giant, giant 3D printer. Or it's just a bunch of, rep of like, it just basically storing anything, retrieving anything. Physically, like from shelves, from drawers, repository, like materials, yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff that people like Amazon work on and they develop those kinds of systems because they're automating all their stuff of course so yeah warehouse automation yeah but there's nothing open source like no, like no I agree it's kind of crazy nothing open source I thought I'd look it up and be like ah oh, we're here here's this project where this guy built it no, it's too too applied. To, it's too too much in a business system. That's not like a lot of the hobby projects don't really go there that far. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's I like need one. industry. Yeah. <laughs> open source does not do like great. Hobbyist world of open source does not do well on industrial applications in general. But so um, so do you understand how this system goes together? Can you put one together? Some solenoid valves. 
what where do we put the controller box or like the little microcontroller I think we should get since this is gonna be out in the environment we should get a little case like weatherproof electrical we box we have those well. we've got yeah we've got plenty of those lying around this um, is the remote control system CB press uh, shows that like our microcontroller it's just a box like there I mean right right there well, I mean, <clears> this thing. yeah this? Uh, that is a rem yeah that, that's actually um, uh, let's see which one is that that's um, does that have Arduino? Yeah, yeah. No, that's just a CB controller, which was doing for. No, no, that's actually that's that's the one that we were working on. That was the the wireless one. So don't take this apart. Um, but this is uh, I'm not sure of that. We never really tested that, but um, but yeah, one a box like that, like on the CB press, just an electrical box. Uh, we've got plenty of those in the shop, uh, so we can put the Put the electronics, the, the, the little microcontroller in there. If we want to do that, so we could we could put that into the, the automation cube, so it's actually weather tight. Yeah. What do we need for the Arduino side? What kind of firmware or software do we need on it to? to so we would need to upload the little sketch that communicates. It's in that video. They kind of talk about it, but you download a or write your little code. That's uh, which compatible with the, the Blink. Yeah, so you basically have to define the pins, which is which is triggering what. Yeah, all right. This so is pretty trivial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a video kind of the one that's right here under this blank app. I mean, there's pretty much they they tell you all the steps of how to do it. Here's download the code, download the extension for Arduino. Download the blank app. So they kind of take you through all the steps in six minutes. What's the, the, the thing called that sits on top of the Arduino? Those are called? Yeah, shields. Shields, yeah. So for the, the shield with the relay, is there some other library or something that you got to access in the Arduino ID in order to... No, for the shield, it's like, it's just physical connections. For that shield in particular, let's discuss just a sec what's happening there. So you got this is your Arduino replacement. Typically the Arduino would be a, another board under this. Here that doesn't oh, fit under that. So what you need to do, you got those headers, you gotta connect wires from that header into those female headers. Because otherwise those those connections would there would be there automatically. Here they're not, so we use the jumper, little jumper wires. Arduino we need a single, like, jumper wires. Now that will work, but Those we things. Universal control with a single integrated Bluetooth Wi-Fi. That's how you can make those connections. We got those. Um, you can use these um, male side, one side, and the female on the other. If you look at this, you've got both male and female headers. Those are just pins connected to the same terminals. That's you can either put a pin in there or put a header on the other side. So that's a mechanical way to connect. And then your your pow your wires to the solenoid. All you got is okay. Here's a triple terminal block. So you connect one wire to. There's the electrical connections right there, and that's that's it. Like. Uh, uh, so you need two wires. You're gonna go like this, connect the two wires into that little uh, electrical enclosure on top. Then one of them is power, one of them like plus minus, and then this board it handles the power. It, yeah, I think I don't know where the power terminals are here. You gotta look at the board, but you gotta connect 12 volts somewhere here. It might be this connector here. I'm not sure. Uh, there's 12 board. volts going. Where's the node M M MCU? Yeah, so this node MCU here. Can I, can I, can it's in a shop, it? yeah. It's on a table by Ken's stuff. But here, like power, you can do through micro USB. So if you do, um, how, what's the easiest way to do that? If you got 12 volts, uh, what is the power there? That would be 5 volts. So how do you get from. 
say we got the battery for the on the micro track how do we do it you can connect how do you get 12 volts out of five split uh five USB five out of 12. And a buck converter you get, that or yeah, I guess your... what's the specs on this? Um, <clears throat> Wes, how do we, if we got a battery, how do we give it, give it well, USB power? You can buy one of the car chargers. All I know is you can use an Arduino Mega, yeah, car five, five, 12 geez. volt input, and then output 5 volt to something like this. You could do that. There's, there's a bunch of different things. You have a buck converter, you have a linear voltage regulator, or there's a whole industry of automotive USB power supplies. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you just get a That's true. Automotive. automotive. Yeah, so those we go on. Uh, things you stick in the. Yeah, it's got a center plug. Center and oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Aut automotive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, those. Um, really? Like yeah. those things. For yeah. This has got two contacts, a center point yeah. and sides. So get one of these <laughs> things for ten bucks off Amazon. If you have you that. Get it from the gas station for five dollars. Yeah. Get one that open. Oh yeah. I got extras in my I got a bag of extras in my RV. <laughs> okay. So we can connect that to the battery and we've got five volts and then we would need a regular USB to micro USB cable. Yeah. Yeah. We have plenty of those. Uh, those are old phone charging cables. Now, uh, and uh, use the cameras. And there's yeah. one right here on the floor right now. Yeah. Chances are within the five ranges. <laughs> one last thing about the C B, like the. You actually need a flyback diode. Uh, so let's just show this. This is uh, CB press, the microcontroller. We show there's a flyback diode. Basically, you got to put a diode across the terminal connections on the solenoid. So what does that do? There's voltage spikes. Like whenever you turn this off, let's see if we can get in there. Um, no. Uh, okay, so that's when you open up the top of the, the solenoid. You connect like whatever, plus, you know, one signal here, plus minus, like whatever, whichever it is, it's going to say it on it, plus minus. Uh, that would be ground because it's connected here, so it's probably plus here, negative here, plus and negative. Now, what you got to do is do a diode, meaning that upon turn off, you get a because there's a moving part in there that's spring loaded it snaps back and it creates electricity feeding back mm -hmm. so you gotta you gotta short circuit that electricity through a little diode so a diode would be actually like this here there you go there's that picture you gotta do that these are just little diodes and they're oriented in um note diode points to positive terminal on solenoid so the diodes have a bar on them like a s silver mark on one end which denotes positive and negative the diode so that the side that's marked with the the line goes to the positive terminal so these are the positive terminals and a line goes to them and that's that's all you got to do and that means that spark is gonna trap short circuit through this instead of going back to your controller because it could fry your controller. If the controller, if the solenoid switch does not have protection. But our solenoid relay, I think that already has protection inside of it because I think it's protected already. So we don't need that to protect the microcontroller, but we do need that to prevent visible sparks. Whenever you turn this thing off, you'll see visible, these terminals are actually gonna spark visibly, little sparks happen there. If you have a diode like this, you will not see those sparks. So is it a Schottky diode? Uh, what's a Schottky diode? They're different from traditional PN junction diodes. The biggest, is the, the biggest difference is that they have a really fast response time, which is why they're used for that particular so like in power electronics, yeah. you would put Schottky diodes over all of your power semiconductors and things like that. They serve the same purpose under fault conditions and turn off, 
you need to be able to dump any residual current in the circuit. But these just shock the diodes respond really quickly, so as soon as the power cuts, they redirect. The Sounds like you want fast response time here, yeah. Uh, any diode, like I never really paid attention whether it's like Schottky or others, but when you Google flyback diode on Amazon, that's what you get. What does it do with the excessive current? It just loops it through the coils of the. So it's making a, like if the coil is connect, you know, coil one end and the other, um, it's connect shorting, short circuiting across the coil. So then the energy flows through the coil and just dies because there's resistance there. Uh -huh. okay. So instead of that energy going wherever else it's connected to, it just um, guides it excessively. So, yeah, I mean, flyback diode. I'm looking for just a simple. Here they get you a module with a bunch of diodes on it. Now we just want these two ones with the leads like this thing. One amp diode, I mean, you want like a, we've got a couple of amps, but a small diode, like as long as it doesn't burn out. It's just a quick, sudden, sudden impulse. Yeah, so stuff like this, these ones, three amp, that would probably do. Because the, how do you rate a diode? Is it by what the normal current is or for what the peak is? Well, the peak is huge. So I think 3 amp refers to the just the regular current that's flowing through that circuit. Yeah. So we just need one of these. Yeah, so uh, a quick look, and it looks like flybacks are, the term came from traditionally just from inductive flow, which makes sense if you have a solid work. So it's just dumping the magnetic current that's the work in the field yep. whenever the power gets up. So it may be different from the semiconductor circuit, but for okay. a similar purpose. It may, mm -hmm. You may not need the high speed response. Yeah, I was looking at, like, does it call these things Schottky diodes? It doesn't say that. No, no, because I don't think you need the high speed associated yeah. with it, right? Because dumped in an inductive... So this is the right there, it's a Schottky. Oh, a second. Because your, your circuit with your inductor is going to have a time constant in it, right? So it can't dump all of this yeah. current instantly. It's going to occur in the but anything that's made for rectifiers, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I don't think the shot key part is critical here. No. Yeah, but any of this, when you Google on, go to Amazon, just get a 3 amp diode. Um, yeah. So minimum product is the block. You got inlet and outlet. You got the solenoids. You got quick connectors on this block here, so there's four quick connectors here from all these these ones here, because you want to make quick connection if we're going to do this for the micro track. So you got six quick couplers on this. Four Take at the top and two at the sides. Yeah. And then the solenoids. Uh, they bolt on. The, right. And then the wiring from the previous system. Wiring that goes from our little. Uh, little relay. All right. That's the concept. All right, so I'm trying to just make sure I get this straight. So the block, this, this uh, can you show the block again? Do you mind showing the block? Mm-hmm. <coughs> okay, yeah, so that's two solenoids. It's the input output and then two. I'm trying to understand how do we then connect, where did the connection go from the quick couplers to uh, to the micro track because we have to yeah. really disconnecting in order to make sure that we get the same control action. Right. So in this diagram, what's the analogy? Here's that's for the C B press. Where's the in and out here? Where's the main in and out? Uh, and out yeah, well here, yeah. In inlet. Yeah, hydraulic power in so whatever you got your power cube whatever disconnect the hoses from the micro track disconnect hoses from the life track this would all work with that it's interchangeable so but you got to consider that one side is the inlet 
for continuity of fluid, you have to have an outlet, which is right here on the other side. So it goes through the block. If nothing happens, if you don't trigger your valves, it just flows free, free flows through the block. It goes back to tank. It just idles, wastes energy. Nothing's happening there. So you could get actually like when you talk about electric, in electric, you'd probably just turn on the motor to activate something. Like you'd turn on a pump. That would be how you turn things on. So you wouldn't be idling all the time. Like with a gas engine, you don't... Whenever you're idling, you're just wasting energy. With electric, you could just trigger whenever you actually want to do something. Yeah. So the electrical systems could be actually much more efficient. Um, but outlet is here. And then we got work ports on the actual valves, the, the block, the block, the, the metal part, which is, it's actually aluminum there. Why aluminum? Because it's easy to machine and you got all these channels in there. So typically those things are aluminum. And uh, you got those four work ports and that's what you connect to your motors in our case for the micro track or whatever load, like the cylinder we're going to test with. Uh, if it just free, you turn on a power cube, just free flows, you can just have it there and the, the, the fluid free flows through it. Does the free flow get shut as soon as you open one of the working ports? It does. Okay. It gets shut and then um, these are, now it gets into details. What happens to the other valve? Where does it get fluid? Well, it actually gets fluid from the return of the first one because these are actually series. Okay. They're not, I don't believe they're parallel, I think. There's tricks to, there's details to that which you got to pay attention to, but um, all we know that if you got this double block, you feed the practical consequences of feeding power into is you can trigger one, you can trigger, trigger the other, you can trigger both. It doesn't matter. Can you put one and forward and the other in reverse? Yeah. Yeah, you can trigger one, each one independently. And they have to be in the It's possible for them to be in series and flow in different directions. So yeah, it's the, all the this complex circuitry inside that block. Okay, so they got all kinds of channels in there. Channel. Yeah. That, how, however, it guides it. And the geometry of the actual valve inside yeah. the uh, solenoid, the, the actual black part. There's that cylindrical valve there that's got its intricacies on it, how it guides fluid, yeah. where it lets it flow. So, um, yeah, but they are, I can tell you they're series because the experience from the brick press was we were surprised when running two, two cylinders at the same time reduced our pressure on like the compression like in the brick press when you turn move the drawer at the same time it actually reduces the pressure you have that that was our experience so you there's detail to this so as is I believe these are series what happens if you want you got another one of these and you would you want to run it like parallel to it or in series well it really depends on your application like well, exactly what you're doing and it can be a lot of different cases say so you want to turn around 180 degrees by having one track go forward and one track go backwards since since they are in series would there be a slightly less mechanical force on one side than the other then? if you're running one then you get the full pressure through it if you run the other, I believe you're getting, you're dividing fluid and, um, man, what I said just doesn't make sense because according to what I said, if it, they're in series, you're dividing both pressure and fluid. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure actually. Okay. And the practical outcome is that we know it spins and it has... All I can tell you is, if you see me driving that, like can, like I was doing it, if you do both valves, you have two motors and you have more pushing power. If you run one valve, you're going to have all that fluid go through one motor at higher speed 
um, it'll go faster. But the torque, because you got one motor instead of two, feels like it's got less less actual drive force. Okay. Okay. This gets into like I want to see the open source design. And, like I never really looked inside these valves to understand deeply what they're doing. Then I could answer the questions like, okay, what what exactly is it? Series or parallel? Uh, it gets a little complicated at that point. Mm -hmm. But I think I get the answer to the question I was looking for, I think. So the, there's probably a double block like that or two separate valves on the micro track already and we need to disconnect both the inlet and outlet and we need to disconnect the uh, workforce. So I can tell you what we got in the, in the micro track. We have the, the loader valves and then that fluid. So there's one valve, double valve for loaders and then it goes downstream and it goes to the wheel drive. So you've got two valves in series, so that the fluid goes through one and then the other. So you've got two. So, but the only thing you got to disconnect is the inlet on the first valve and the outlet on the second valve. So, because they're going flowing through to each other, it goes into the first one, goes out the second. So, first valve, outlet goes to the inlet of the second valve, and then through the outlet. Of the second valve. So we also need to disconnect the work ports on the second valve and connect them to the work ports on this valve, right? Yes, okay. right, because then you got to take the wires, the, the hoses that go to the wheel motors and then plug them into our new controller, yep, okay. into this thing. All right, then conceptually, I think I'm Yeah. Okay, should we get started? Oh yeah. Yeah. Quickly dump some calories into my body. No regard to what I'm actually eating. That leftover mac and cheese, is that the one you had for yourself? No, no, that's all.